As chair and professor of Bible exposition, I look forward to each October as we uh, bring in someone from our nation who is well known for his ability to exposit the scriptures. And uh, this year, we're really excited uh, not to have to go too far uh, in this nation, uh, but to um, have Dr. Mark Bailey, our former president and uh, chancellor of our school, come and share with us. We look for someone who is well known and who can come and not only minister the word, but can demonstrate to us how he gets the author's meaning and the significance and application that can be drawn from that. I think each one of us who have been here in chapel have shown our appreciation at the end of the message for how the Lord has uh, used his word uh, through Dr. Bailey to speak to us. But Dr. Bailey, I know you just don't get up here and wing it. <laughs> uh, you have spent hundreds of hours in study, uh, reading the scripture, uh, looking at the Hebrew, uh, reading commentaries of uh, godly people who have dealt with this passage. And most and perhaps more importantly, is, as you've spent time before the Lord, uh, just discerning uh, what he's saying to you, applying it to your own life, and then applying it to us. And so just before I pray, I'd like you to join me in thanking Dr. Mark Bailey for all of the time and effort and study he has put into this series. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for how good you are, what a great father you are to us. And we thank you as a father for making sure that we have plenty to eat. Thank you for giving us your word, uh, that we can feast upon your word and gain strength to live for you. Father, thank you for Dr. Bailey and his good wife, Barbie, as they have spent time uh, ministering uh, to the school over the years. And now, Father, for him, as he comes to minister to us from your book of Haggai, that you would um, help him to understand we are extremely thankful. We've been blessed uh, by you through him. And so be with him as he comes and ministers your word to us right now. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for the privilege of being here this week. I don't consider that a light invitation, and uh, it's a privilege for me to uh, be back on our campus and to see you in weird circumstances. Uh, without question, it looks like I'm speaking to a medical convention uh, <laughs> in, here in this room of uh, all the doctors who showed up who have the disease. And uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, all of you are sitting there desperately hoping that somebody next to you has the answer to that disease that all of you are studying uh, at that particular time. But uh, it is uh, for those of you who are not here, we wish you were here and uh, we're grateful for the uh, uh, technology that allows us to uh, take these uh, uh, so, uh, chapels uh, each and every week uh, around the world. And so I uh, have comments from people, not about this week as much as other weeks, uh, of uh, the blessing that DTS chapels are and uh, that they are made available. NFL Films made an in-game gaffe by Minnesota Viking defensive end Jim Marshall famous. Uh, almost 56 years ago, a prominent member of the famously named back then the Viking Purple People Eaters, Marshall is regarded as one of the finer defensive linemen of his era. However, it was an infamous play from a game against the San Francisco 49ers on October 25th, 1964, that brought him arguably his best, no, his biggest fame. He alertly snagged a loose ball that was fumbled by San Francisco's Billy Kilmer and Marshall ran unencumbered to the end zone. Unfortunately, he had become disoriented when he picked up the fumble and he ran it to the wrong end zone. So rather than six points for the Vikings, he scored a safety for the 49ers. Uh, because of that play, unfortunately, he has never been drafted into the Hall of Fame. He did the right thing, picked up the fumble, fumbled by the 
opponent, but he did the wrong thing in running it the wrong way. I put as a title for this week, Doing God's Work God's Way, because uh, such a classic example in the historic world of sports, but it's far more horrific when it happens when we try to do the work of the Lord in the wrong way. The book of Haggai is a book written in 520 BC in the fall of 520 BC. For those of you joining us today for the first time, there are four many messages given in the fall of 520 BC in the second year of Darius. The Israelites have come back after captivity. Uh, They came back uh, uh, in 536 BC approximately and began work on the temple foundation They got into it about 14, 15, 16 months and quit because of uh, opposition, discouragement, uh, disappointment. And uh, so for 14 years, nothing has happened on the temple that God wanted them to rebuild. So God uh, brings them back under the reign of Zerubbabel, his his rule, his leadership as the governor. And uh, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, And uh, under uh, Zerubbabel and Ezra, the people come back, and uh, yet they haven't finished the work. And so God raises up Haggai and Zechariah, those two minor prophets with major messages, of saying, in essence, uh, you thought that the uh, reason you couldn't finish the temple was because of uh, your circumstances. In chapter 1, God says your circumstances are the result of you not having finished the temple. And the discipline of God... Uh, sometimes takes uh, climactic, climatic disasters, especially under Israel's economy with the curses of the covenant, with the people in the land, with physical demonstrations of God's blessing or cursing on their crops, on their farms, their family, and uh, all that they raise. Then he uh, stirs them to consider their ways, and they start building. They respond in obedience to the word of God. They uh, uh, are moved by the spirit of God in their worship, and their work becomes uh, their service for the Lord. And that's chapter 1, in which uh, there was a message of courage, excuse me, of conviction, because they had uh, run to panel their own houses while the house of the Lord remained unfinished. So it was a message of challenge and conviction. In the message we saw yesterday, the second message of Haggai, it's a message of uh, uh, courage. Take courage, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatiel. Take courage, son of Josedek, high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, and work. Why? Because uh, I'm with you in the same way I've been with you from the time I called you out of Egypt. And I've been with Moses, and I've been with Joshua, and I've been with Solomon in building the temple, and I'm with you in the rebuilding of the temple. And then he gives us that perspective that uh, if this one doesn't look too good, you ought to wait for the latter stage of what God is doing. There's a former glory of Solomon's house. There's a present uh, function that's not so glorious right now of Zerubbabel's temple, but he says there is coming a time in the future when I'll shake the heavens and the earth and I'm, I'm going to bring the wealth of all the nations. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And in that place, I'm going to put my peace. The ultimate cry of all of our hearts is for the restoration of shalom. And he says it's coming. And I'm going to put it in an end time temple that Ezekiel describes in 40 to 48 as a phenomenal structure and a phenomenal rebuilt uh, temple with a rebuilt and reallotted land with a different kind of sacrifice, with a different kind of priesthood, with different kinds of furniture, all to celebrate what will ultimately happen in the death of Christ. So this morning we come to the third and fourth message, so I hope you packed a lunch. (laughs) And we're going to cover two messages in chapter 2. And uh, it's in this section that we come to a message of the need of cleanliness. A message of cleanliness. And I want to give you an illustration. Some of you realize that... uh, Uh, We're putting these two together, and so in in this session, let me show you, uh, uh, combining two messages, I did it under the title of Living in Purity and Perspective. Uh, Worship incorporated, worship invalidated in the first section, and then I've titled the last three or four verses, When the Ring Becomes the Thing, and I think you'll see why. 
Ironically, in this message, neither Zerubbabel nor Joshua are directly addressed. But I want to show you a visual aid of a surgical suite. I have a background in x-ray technology for 11 years. Use that. I was headed to pre-med when God turned me around, and I uh, worked my way through uh, uh, both uh, uh, my master's degrees up in Portland and then my doctoral degree here working in hospitals and doctor's offices. And uh, if you know anything about the medical field, you understand that uh, there is a need, especially in surgery, for what's called a sterile field. Uh, it is a room, uh, a surgical suite, a theater, some of them called, uh, and it's all been uh, cleaned and sterilized like nothing you've ever even been thought about in terms of COVID. And uh, everybody gowns up, and I remember when I first went in, you put on booties over your shoes uh, that had uh, the ability to keep sparks from happening because you didn't want to ignite any fires when there's that much oxygen flowing. Uh, you had, uh, we call them the greens, and we had tops, we had bottoms, we had a hat, and then we had masks. And then if you were going to touch anything, you had to be gloved up. And doctors scrub in, as you know, and nurses scrub in before they open a body because of the danger of contamination. If you decided you wanted to watch a surgical procedure and you walked in, having not scrubbed in, having not gowned up, and you walked in that surgical suite, the whistles would blow, the alarms would go, you'd probably get crucified by the charge nurse because you had just contaminated a sterile field. But if as a doctor or a nurse and you were scrubbed in and gowned up and you walked out of the surgical suite and you went down the hallway and said, touch, touch you, you're clean, touch you, you're clean, touch you, you're clean, would it work that way becomes a question. And transfer that uh, medical analogy to the priesthood. He begins to ask a series of questions that he opens up in the illustration of defilement because he wants us to know that impurity is more insidious and pervasive than anybody might think. Impurity is more insidious and pervasive than any of us might think. And he frames this argument by two penetrating questions. Look at it with me. His first question is, does holiness come by contact? In verses 10 through 12. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, that would equate to December 18 on our calendars, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. Literally a Torah. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? In other words, he's asking the question as if a priest who's been cleansed and he carries holy meat that would be useful for sacrifice and he puts it in the fold of his, uh, the, the apron of his tunic, so to speak. And he starts walking around and touching things because he's a priest who's clean and the meat is holy. If he touches other things, does that make other things holy? And while we wish we could say yes, the answer to that is a resounding no. Does holiness come by contact? Let me ask you a question. Does holiness come through church? Does holiness come through seminary classes? Does holiness come through seminary messages? Does profs walk down the hallway and say, Domini, Domini, you're all holy? <laughs> the answer is no. It doesn't come through your study. Study is important. Do it. The Bible commands it. But uh, that's not what makes you holy. One of the most disappointing things you will find as you get to be my age, which we'll leave unmentioned at the point, is that spiritual giftedness is no guarantee of spirituality. Spiritual giftedness doesn't guarantee your spirituality. The gift is a gift. Spirituality is a result of walking with the Spirit in obedience and submission. Many of us have watched gifted leaders fall in our lifetime. It had nothing to do with their talent, their knowledge, or their gifting. Phenomenal gifting by God, but disqualified. Because for some reason, they thought holiness came through function, or holiness came through contact. And the reason why the answer is no is because impurity is incommunicable. 
excuse me, purity is incommunicable. Holiness can't be transferred. Righteousness doesn't come by ritual. The ritual of the hand doesn't make one righteous as Jesus exposed with the Pharisees. No one was more dedicated to the text than the scribes. But they missed the heart of God. Lips were near. Heart was on a vacation. Or I should say, off the reservation. That leads us to a truth that uh, is a living theology that comes out of this text, and that is that religious activities don't make one righteous. You can be a priest and not be righteous. You can have holy meat in your apron. That doesn't make what you do with it righteous. That leads to another question then. Was does, if holiness doesn't come by contact, does defilement come by contact? Verse 13, then Haggai said, if, if one who is unclean from a corpse or touches any of these things, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answers in the affirmative, it will become unclean. See, it's the insidious nature of impurity that uh, if holiness doesn't come by contact, impurity does. And that's why the New Testament talks about coming out, being separate, and touch not the unclean thing. And he goes into five questions. If I can summarize them all, Satan and Christ do not sing duets. He asks, is there harmony between Belial and God? The answer is no. They don't sing duets. Uh, they don't sing the same song. They sing in different keys with different lyrics. It's insidious, but does defilement come by contact? The answer is yes. Why? Because impurity is communicable. Defilement is transferable. And while the ritual of the hand doesn't make the heart righteous, the defiled heart does defile the work of the hands. Notice how he finishes that phrase. So is this people. There's that distancing we saw in chapter 1. So is this nation, not my people, not my nation, but this people, this nation. He's wanting to be a little distant here. There's moral and social separation here. And so is every work of their hands. The moral, the social, the religious activities. While righteousness is not transferable, defilement is transferable. And that leads us to another truth from this section, and that is that the unrighteousness of the heart. Please don't miss this. The unrighteousness of the heart invalidates one's work and worship of God. You can be doing all the right things the wrong way. And I'm ever so conscious and ever so convicted that we don't come to do holy things with an unholy heart. All of us will from time to time not have it all together. But growing in spirituality, you're still qualified to do spiritual things. Grieving and lying and quenching the spirit, you might do religious activities, but it doesn't do spiritual things that God counts. So is this people. So is this nation. God wants to address the heart not just our hands. Point B, the instruction on discipline. In 2, 15 to 19, he says, do consider three times in four verses. In other words, think, think, think. Through Haggai, God is asking his people to think about what causes discipline and to think about what causes blessing. So I want you to see the discipline of the Lord in 15 to 17, and then I want you to see in 18 and 19, the blessing of the Lord. But now do consider from this day onward, and he basically is going back and saying, I want you to think calendar with me. He says, from the day the stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, from the time we started, from that time when one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, there would only be 10, and when one would come to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there would only be 20. What happened? Watch this. We saw it in chapter 1. We see it here in chapter 2. I smote you and every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail, yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. This is pregnant with truth. 
It is not above God to use natural disaster for supernatural discipline. We saw that in the first chapter. Does every nature event mean that we are under discipline? We ought to ask, are we? We may not be able to affirm it. We can't know the mind of God in that detail. But every time we're in negative circumstances, we ought to say, God, what are you saying to me through this? What do you want to happen in our country through this? Whether it's a hurricane coming in the southern coast, whether it's COVID-19 that pervades our, our, our planet, God, what do you want to say to us? Ironically, he says, with mildew, that's overabundant, uh, and hail, that's an overabundance of uh, water and rot. It, it, but he's got and, uh, the blasting wind, mildew and hail. He sort of covers it, whether it's dry or wet. I did it. Now, why did God do it? Yet you did not come back to me. The backward look. It began with sin. It resulted in natural disaster. It manifested itself in disqualified service. The descriptions that parallel the covenant curses are described here from Deuteronomy 28. You see, God is immediately active and personally responsible for the physical difficulties that face us. But notice, yet you did not come back to me. The Hebrew idiom here is difficult to translate. Uh, One scholar put it this way. Probably a more literal translation would read, watch this, and there is not you to me. (laughs) In other words, why did I do all of this was to get you to come back to me. But you and I aren't here together. That leads us to a truth. The purpose of God's discipline is always restoration. The purpose of God's discipline is always restoration. It's true in church discipline. It's true in personal discipline. Whom the Lord loves, he smacks. That's Bailey's translation. But what for? Because he loves us. He wants us back. And I've developed a a statement, I've never heard it anywhere else, but my study through the scripture over the years, and especially my love for prophetic scriptures of the future, I've discovered as I read through the scriptures that every judgment, every judgment prior to final judgment, in reality is an expression of God's patience and grace. See, all the way through Revelation, that even the plagues of Revelation that will come in the tribulation, Yet they did not repent. Yet they did not repent. What was the purpose? For them to repent. Scribes and the Pharisees, Luke chapter 7, rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized with the baptism of John. What was God's purpose through the ministry of Christ to the scribes and the Pharisees? It was restoration, not annihilation. Every judgment prior to final judgment is in reality a demonstration of God's grace and his mercy. You see, if the disciplines of the Lord are consistent with his covenant, so are his blessings. And that leads us to 18 and 19, where he continues that think, think, theme, do consider. Now, from this day on, notice, from that day on, there was disobedience that resulted in disasters. But from this day on, what can happen? I love this. Watch this. Do consider from this day on, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, think, is the seed still in the barn? The answer to that is, yeah. Including the vine, yeah, the fig tree, yeah, the pomegranate, yeah, the olive tree. It has not yet borne fruit. In other words, when you start obeying, there's not necessarily an instant tree with all the fruit on it. But you need to know from this day on, I will bless you. Men and women, this is phenomenal. From the moment you start obeying God, from the moment you start saying yes to God, from that day on, God says, blessing is available to you. And the seed is planted. The fruit will show up. From this day on. Today starts the clock all over again. His mercies are new when? Every morning. Why? Because his great faithfulness. Wherever you are this morning, today can restart and hence redirect your future in the blessing of God. 
Principle never changes. New Testament, Old Testament. The kinds of blessings and the kinds of disciplines are different. Maybe not as different as we think. We're not living in the land of Israel, watching the crops of Israel. But God's not bound to the geography of Israel to bring blessing or discipline. Obedience brings blessing. Disobedience brings discipline. So this principle that present obedience guarantees future blessing, that's that forward look. It began with obedience. Covenant blessings are guaranteed in the future. Their future would be better than their past. And your future, my future, can be better than my past. When Chuck became president, Chuck Swindoll became president, he had a little statement that uh, our, our dreams are bigger than our memories. And it was a forward-thinking vision of uh, whatever God has done in the history of DTS, what God can do in the future can even be better. Not because of us, trust me, not because of us, but because of him. Faithfulness will ultimately bear fruitfulness. I love John Calvin's statement, it is the integrity of the heart that keeps our work and worship from being insignificant. It's the integrity of our heart that keeps our work and our worship from being insignificant. That leads us to the fourth and final message of this little book, delivered on the same day. So uh, he did two messages on one day, we're gonna do two messages on one day. So we come to the fourth message, which is a message of promise. It's a consummating message, as you'll see. And I want you to see it in uh, that big picture. There's the four messages on the screen. A message of conviction, talking about redirecting priorities. A message of courage that's rooted in the peace that God promises to place one day in the temple, in Jerusalem, in history before eternity. This message of cleanliness to emphasize the purity necessary for the blessing of God in our lives and in our ministries. And now this consummation, the promise of the future. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. And now he does address Zerubbabel. See, while he doesn't address them in the third message, it's a message that's related to the priesthood. Now there's another message here on the same day that's related to the governor. So you get the religious and the political both covered on these two. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of kingdoms of the nations, and I'll overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. We talked about it earlier, but in, uh, when you study theology, we talk about the mediating sovereignty of God and the immediate sovereignty of God. Uh, immediate sovereignty is when God alone does it. He's front and center, personally, actively responsible for what he's doing, like shaking the heavens and the earth. Only he can do that. But his mediating sovereignty works through nations, good ones and bad ones, good leaders and bad leaders. He can work on the heart of a Pharaoh. He can work on the heart of a Nebuchadnezzar, a Cyrus, an Artaxerxes, a Darius. He can work in whatever person, whatever nation he wants to, to accomplish his purpose. And in fact... Notice what he says, I'm going to overthrow the kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. See, this is the part that uh, isn't politically correct to, uh, for us because uh, people don't understand God has the right to do that. But God is going to, if I can say it, upset the cosmic apple cart to establish his kingdom. And I love Revelation says, then the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom singular of our Lord and his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Watch what he does with this. I'm going to overthrow the thrones, the kingdoms, destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. I'll overthrow the chariots and the riders. The horses and the riders will go down. Everyone by the sword of another. God's sovereign enough to just whistle. <laughs> and the teams start competing, and the nations start warring, and he accomplishes his sovereign purpose. You'd almost think he was in control. Think it, because he is. You see it in two ways. First, his power, he's sovereign over nature, heavens and the earth. Second, he's sovereign over nations. His sovereign is over nature and nations. God is sovereign over nature and nations. His power, his purpose. 
God is in control. That old song, it's a cute one for some people. He has the whole world in his hands. There's a way you can sing that where you don't understand that, but this book won't let you get past it. Lord Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. In Greek, the translation is kurios pantokrator. Kurios is Lord, panta is everything, krator, krateo, meaning to grab with a hand, so to speak. We could paraphrase it, he's the one who has his hands on everything. Nations, nature, God is sovereign. And in that, he has a plan for the future, and that is the point B, that Zerubbabel will be the signet king. On that day, he's talking about the ultimate future, when his kingdom gets established, on that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. That day is a day frequently used with the eschatological nuance of Old Testament prophecy for the ultimate day of the Lord. Now you say, wait a minute, Zerubbabel's going to die. How can Zerubbabel be a signet ring in the end time prophecy of God's kingdom program? Well, let me explain it very quickly, and I'll have to fly fast here. The signet ring is a tool that was used to seal documents and decrees showing authority and ownership. And the reliability of this promise is that Zerubbabel, as their governing leader, is a sign, a symbol, a type, if you would be, of an unyet-seen Messiah who is going to show up. But the question is, will Zerubbabel still be there? Ironically, the Old Testament says David will be there. Zerubbabel is promised to be there. Ironically, in Matthew uh, 19.28, it says that the 12 disciples will be there, sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. The Bible says the church, one day God will crush Satan under your feet. And when you get to Revelation chapter 5, toward the end of that chapter, when he says God has made from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign with him where? On the earth. Guess what, folks? Zerubbabel will be there. David will be there. You'll be there. The disciples will be there and will reign with the ultimate one. Now, this signet ring is not so unimportant. We don't have the time to go back to Jeremiah chapter 22, where the curse on Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, was promised to be childless and no one would sit on his throne. Ironically, this becomes the reversal of that curse. Because let me show you a chart. Zerubbabel, a signet ring, his selection, I'll take you, I'll make you, I'll, I've chosen you to watch this. Let's skip this one. We'll come back to this one. But uh, the Davidic line on the left side goes through Solomon. The right side goes through Nathan. When you get to the Gospels and you look at the genealogies, Joseph is a legal son of Solomon who adopts Jesus, as we would understand it, and names him in accordance with Gabriel. Nathan, don't miss this. I love this about David. David was willing to name one of his sons after the prophet who had confronted him. Does that tell you something about his heart? Can that, isn't that amazing? The one who said, thou art the man. In David's repentance, he names one of his sons, Nathan, and it's through Nathan that Mary comes. But I want you to see another thing. In between these two, there is some cross, I was going to say ventilation, but fertilization. And you have Sheatil and Zerubbabel in both of their lines because God reverses the curse and brings Jesus, virgin-born son of God, out of that remarkable history. And so Sheatil, who, by the way, is an ultimate descendant of Coniah or Jeconiah, who is the father of Zerubbabel, he's in the godly line. And so David and Zerubbabel, the disciples, and you. And people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people will be in that kingdom of priests to our God. I want to stop there. 
and I want to take you on a quick little journey as we close. If you'll grant me a couple minutes here. I love to work my way through a text and then go back and say, what did God want us to know about him? And this is, uh, this is the biblical theology that uh, supports the systematic theology where we synthesize the attributes of God and the actions of God, but it's in the biblical theology of text by text in uh, the line of history with the literature uh, coming in the progressive revelation of God that you get the details of that. And so just rapidly, here we go. What do I learn in just these two chapters? 25 things about God. Listen to him, don't try to write him down. He reveals his word. He knows people's hearts. He invites careful thinking. He commands right actions. He disciplines disobedient lifestyles. He controls the natural elements. He speaks through his messengers. He promises his presence. He stirs people's spirits. He's pleased by appropriate worship. He exhorts to appropriate works. He sends his spirit. He'll fulfill his promises and his purposes. He maintains his standard of holiness, but he blesses obedience. He disciplines disobedience. He'll defeat his enemies. He chooses whom he wills. He uses whom he chooses. He is the center of all prophetic expectations. How should we respond? Just listen to this, it won't be on the screen. God is sovereign even in times when it doesn't seem like he is. Therefore, I can trust him. Even the wrath and wars of humanity, the polarities and the politics, are scenes in the drama of the divine one. Therefore, I should worship him. The fulfillment of prophecy will ultimately vindicate the character of God. Therefore, I should rest in him. Barbie's brother sings a song. Let me just quote the lyrics as we close. We believe in the Father who created all that is. We believe the universe and all therein is his. As a loving heavenly Father, he yearned to save us all, to lift us from the fall, we believe. We believe in Jesus, the Father's only Son, existing uncreated before time had begun, a sacrifice for sin, he died and then rose again to ransom sinful men, we believe. We believe in the spirit who makes believers one. Our hearts are filled with his presence. The comforter has come. The kingdom unfolds in his plan, unhindered by the quarrels of man. His church upheld by his hand, we believe. Though the earth be removed and time be no more, these truths are secure. God's word shall endure. Whatever may change, these things are sure. We believe. So if the mountains are cast down into the plains, when kingdoms all crumble, his one remains. Our faith is not subject to seasons of men. With our fathers we proclaim. We believe our Lord will come as he said. The land and the sea will give up their dead. His children will reign with him as their head. We believe. We believe. If I could leave you with a final few thoughts to walk away with. If you haven't already adopted the priorities of God, obedience, worship, service. Maintain a sensitivity to his spirit. Allow him to still squish your heart. Press your heart towards Christ-likeness. Trust the promises of God. What he promised, he'll do. Validate the condition of your hands with the consecration of your heart. Make sure, if I can say it this way, you do seminary in the spirit. It'll last a lot longer in your life. And finally, by faith, Guard your heart and wait for the win. We know how the book ends. Then the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And he will reign forever. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you.